What's up, everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Bartender. Today's episode is a mind blower. We're talking about chatbots and AI and HR, and we are super excited to have the CEO of Me Be Bot, Beth White, on the program. If you don't know Beth, you should get on that because she is amazing. Not only does she run a fast-growing tech startup in lovely Austin, Texas, she's been the head of HR for several firms, spent time in the microbreweries of the Northwest, and even worked on a commercial fishing boat in Alaska. This is a relevant topic for all of us in the people space, and it's just a damn fun conversation. So buckle up, TC beers, grab your favorite cocktail, and let's get right on into it with Beth White on today's TCB. Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender. If you work in HR or make people decisions in your organization, this is the place to be. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to The Corporate Bartender, episode 87 on the 19th of May. I say it every time, but 2021 is going by faster than even 2020 did, and I don't know how to process that. I don't know how you guys are doing, but it seems like it's just whizzing by. So I do see some new folks. Um, We always like to welcome new folks and give them the opportunity to say hello. Uh, So I will pick a few of you at random and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, not to put anybody on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot right now. So I'm going to start with Victor because he's the first person that uh, I talked to today when he came on. So Victor, just tell us who you are, where you are, what you do, and then tell us one really boring fact about you. Well, so what I do, in addition to being on the MeBeBot team, I also have two separate consulting companies. One is on HR, consulting on uh, how to recruit better, how to upgrade HR processes so they meet businesses' needs, and another company nice. called Innovation One. And there we assess a company's culture and capability to be innovative using an empirically developed assessment. Before that, This is probably the boring part. I led HR for large global business units of Honeywell and for Medtronic. Mm. And um, the other boring thing about me is I have a daughter who's a comic in Hollywood. And uh, there's nothing more humbling when you're a parent than have one of your children grow up and be a comic in Hollywood. (laughs) All secrets revealed. And it's true. And we we chose to invite her to our Mibi Ba happy hour one night so that she could make fun of her dad in front of all of us. That's fantastic. (laughs) Yeah. Why not? That's awesome. Well, Victor, uh, since you mentioned innovation and and your uh, place in that space, um, you may want to check out the the bartender episode released just yesterday with Lori's boss, Phil McKinney, who is an innovation thought leader dude. And it was just a fantastic episode. Really, really good stuff. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And welcome. Dawn, how about you? Well, hey, hi, everybody. I am on uh, best team. Let's see. I've uh, been in sales all my life, been selling enterprise software forever. Used to have a computer company for like 20 years. So that was a lot of fun. Um, Let's see. Boring stuff about. Oh, here's a good one. So my husband and I went to Austin for one week vacation and stayed for five years. And (laughs) that is how I got to end up knowing Beth. I I decided we didn't want to run through all our money because we were partying. You know, so so I met Beth when when I went and got a job. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Well, welcome, Dawn. I'm back in Southern California right now, but uh, yeah, I do miss Austin. I'll be glad when we can travel again. Right on. Well, welcome. Good to see you. Liz, how about you? Oh, no, on the spot. Um, (laughs) Hi, um, I'm an HR journalist with the Bethesda Game Studios in Austin, Texas. Um, I've, yeah, been trying to get through this uh, past year with a trying to homeschool a seven-year-old and then I had a seven-year-old son and then I had a newborn son right before the pandemic hit so oh good timing good timing (laughs) you are officially wonder woman let's just (laughs) say it right now (laughs) maternity leave is basically like a version of quarantine so it just kind of rolled in together um 
As far as, uh, let's see. What's, I mean, one I, what's one boring thing about you, Liz? I can't go boring. I'm going to have to go fun. Uh, Do it. <laughs> fun. Fuck the I system. <laughs> used to work at Disney World, and one of my uh, favorite experiences uh, from there was going to the top of Cinderella's Castle, um, where Tinkerbell flies from. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I had little girls once upon a time, and that was a big deal. That was a really big deal. Well, welcome, Liz. Uh, it's good to have another member of the Austin Army here on The Bartender. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're connected to David in some way, or at least you heard about it via David's people. David's yeah. like an evangelist now. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> did you get the uh, word when I sent it out to the HR roundtable, Liz? I did, and yeah, it was it was a very warm introduction that made me want to come check it out. Thank you. Right it is on. a fun group, right? Uh, they don't turn on you. Well, not yet, anyway, but <laughs> they generally don't turn on you. <laughs> Well, Liz, we won't turn on you. David, I can't speak for. We may turn on him. Chris Carlin, how Bring about it. you? <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, let's see. So, B, um, I'm an HR business partner here in Austin as well. Again, also via David. Um, I'm currently with Hippo Insurance. And let's see, something boring about me. Um, Probably the most boring thing is I'm I am not of the work at home revolution folks that jumped at the chance to work from home. I worked from home for years. I was excited to get back to an office, and um, my boring thing is during the I, I actually enjoyed being home during the quarantine and just reading books. <laughs> I right. had a lot more I had a lot more time to catch up on reading. <laughs> so. That's that's fantastic. You got to whittle that pile on the nightstand down, right? And loved every minute of it. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, great to meet you. Uh, welcome, Chris. Kevin Campbell, how about you? Hi there. Um, yeah, I'm Kevin Campbell. I'm working with uh, Beth White and the Maybe Bot team and doing some sales and marketing work right now. Uh, my background's been in software development with some companies like Infor and Oracle in the past. And Something bores a lot of people would consider it boring, but I really enjoy uh, marching bands, high school, college marching bands. Yeah. As a former band geek, I high five you. <laughs> right on. Well, welcome, guys. Welcome, everyone. Is there another Lori? I because I see Lori Freemeyer, but there's oh. another Lori. And they spell it correctly. That's right. Oh, oh, that's, that's Lori's you phone. phone. <laughs> I'm trying to turn off my phone. I'm I'm in Houston today, so mm -hmm. just you could go have happy hour. Oh no, I guess that's far from Austin, but <laughs> <laughs> it is a ways. Usually in Houston, they say, "God, I wish I was in Austin right now." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a true thing. That is a true thing. <laughs> well, welcome, everybody. For, for you new folks, uh, we do have a little social network where we get together uh, and share ideas called uh, the Bartender Network at this web address here, v-corporate-bartender.mn.co. We'll toss that into the chat before we get done here today. And because we have new folks, I get to do my thing. There it is. You can get the app and do it on your phone. It's fantastic. <laughs> We've got some some guests upcoming. We've got a, a guy called Ira Wolf, whose uh, space is on adaptability, which is a pretty welcome skill set to have during these times. Uh, that's going to be on June 2nd. And then on June 19th, Misha Rubin will be here talking about post-pandemic careers. So some fun things to look forward to. But let's get into the news that you can use. Got a couple of, of articles for you today. Uh, this was an HBR that came out this week on how to set up remote employees for success on day one. Um, we, we've talked a lot about onboarding remote employees and how we've been doing nothing but remote employees for the last big chunk of time. Um, but I thought this was interesting because it just sort of called it out in a nice, easy to digest format you know, things, things that we know we should do that we just don't always do. We didn't even do when we were setting up onboarding for people in person. Um, <laughs> right, like, isn't that the truth? Right? <laughs> we should probably do this for people in person too. <laughs> I, I, I have started more than one job where I showed up on day one and did not have a computer. Right. 
right? Mm-hmm. And and so it's things like that, right? It's identifying a dedicated onboarding liaison, somebody that that person can talk to, uh, give them a way to create a connection with the company before the first day. You know, I've been involved in some organizations that have done a really good job of that. They send you a little, you know, little welcome basket and some tchotchkes, you know, and you can send new employees old marketing things from three years ago. They don't care, right? It's cool. They get they get a company logo shirt, even if it's the last logo or the wrong colors, doesn't matter. Um, building strong one-on-one relationships. Uh, and the one that I thought that really stood out for me was explaining the culture, uh, making the unspoken assumptions explicit. And this is a thing that Morag says all the time, right? She talks about making the implicit explicit, and it's just a way that she, you, 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 we take a lot of things for granted and new people just don't know. So this article recommends that you designate a culture buddy, which I thought was kind of cool. And then um, the last thing that they, they mentioned was connecting, helping an individual connect the work that they do day to day to the broader mission, vision, and goals, right? This is that getting a connection to what the company's about, <laughs> tying it to what we actually do. Um, and it's that line of sight from, from frontline employee to achieving the mission of the company. So I thought that was cool. And then related to our topic today, uh, this was an article that came out actually in 2019, but I thought it was relevant. These are 10 HR trends in the age of AI. And uh, a lot of the things in this article were relevant. This is a, a Forbes article, uh, and I'll get the links over on the, on the network here in the next day or so. Um, but of those 10, I won't go through them all, but there were some interesting ones. Um, new jobs will be created using artificial intelligence. And I think that's evidence because that's what best company does. I don't know that this job existed five years ago or even three years ago. Beth, when did this start to become a thing, the chatbot revolution? Well, you know, when I started getting wind of chatbots, I I think would have to be probably four to five years ago when I recognized them on consumer facing websites. Like, frankly, my my bank started to utilize chatbots as a help. And I saw it also on AT&T's website. So I think when we all started to get kind of familiar with it, you know, in a in a more widespread manner. But the history of chatbots go back to, you know, the Turing test in the 1940s. So um, I have taught a course on how to leverage AI for HR in the past. And one of the things we talk about is the history of AI and how long it has been around. Um, One of the first bots was actually a mental health chat bot. Mm. Pretty, pretty fascinating. Now, they're not, they weren't consumer friendly, they were more a lot of programmer code back then in the in the 40s and 50s. However, they were onto something. They were w- working under that premise of how do we how do we teach a machine to think and learn? And that's the use case they started with was this consulting kind of bot to help um, in therapy. So it's pretty fascinating. That is pretty fascinating. Yeah, and we'll we'll get deeper into that when when we break into our conversation. There were some other there were some other things on there that I thought was that I thought were pretty cool. You know, the new jobs thing, skills based hiring, gaining traction. You know, we were we were talking about this not too long ago, um, just the the notion of A.I. in recruitment and the and the biases therein. Um, but that aside, right, focusing more on on skill versus anything else, which I thought was interesting. Um <laughs> One of the other things that I think is is we're starting to see play out, um, and this played out in an article that uh, I believe, I believe who was it that posted it today on on the network? It was on people being willing to trade working from home for a thirty thousand dollar increase. Yeah, I put that out there. Isn't that interesting? That's mm. fascinating, right? And the the trend here in this article was employees will trade money for meaning at work. And I thought that article that you posted, David, was just like have a real real time example of that. Right. And thirty thousand dollars is not a, not anything to be sneezed at at most organizational levels. Right. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think the conversation right now, in fact, earlier in that first posting you came up with on setting up the remote uh, employee for success in day one and culture, I think mm-hmm. the topic of how do you maintain culture if you maintain a remote workforce, right? What does that look and feel like, right? Because you lose kind of a tangibility associated with uh, that. And then just the whole notion of uh, where do I gain satisfaction uh, from a uh, performance and retention standpoint? All those things, I think, are just out there in the conversation of uh, business leaders and HR leaders right now. It's fascinating to see how this plays out. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> the, the last one here that I'll bring up is the HR call to action. And it's a it's another little tagline here that uses two of Morag's favorite taglines. It's preparing for the future of work is a team sport. Right. Morag wrote a book called The Future Proof Workplace that talks all about that. And uh, we always talk about work being a team sport. And, and it is right. We don't we don't high perform alone. We just can't. So two little tidbits there for you. Some goodness for you to go read after we talk today. But let's get on into our conversation with Beth. Hey, Beth. Say hey to everybody. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. It's good to see all, all these people out there. Oh, I love the applause. <laughs> <laughs> so, Beth, you are the CEO of Me Be Bot. But this isn't your first rodeo. You've done things before this. Tell us a little bit about who you are and your journey that got you here to be running this organization, including any weirdo jobs that you might have had along your way. I know. I I told Eric about a couple weirdo jobs I had, and I think he's like, yes, you've got to talk about some of those. (laughs) In in my mind, you learn what you want to do from learning what you don't want to do, right? (laughs) And so you've got to try some things before you get it right. Um, So, you know, I am like many people, you know, went to college, wasn't quite sure what I was doing when I graduated, and I really fell into HR. But before I fell into HR, ended up having a lot of student loan debt. So I worked on a fishing boat up in Alaska. So that was one of my first kind of weirdo jobs, you know, like, and, like Beth, like a, like a deadliest catch kind of fishing boat. You know, it's that <laughs> show came out like after I was off the boats and everybody thinks of that. And those boats that those folks are on those crabber boats are incredibly dangerous. I worked on these ginormous factory trawler fishing boats that frankly, I'm not as proud of because they were the ones that kind of did a little bit of overfishing in in the Bering Sea of Alaska. But if you're eating a McDonald's fish filet, uh, nine times out of 10, it came from, and this boat is still working, Alaska Ocean Seafoods. And so uh, they're still working out of uh, Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and based in Anacortes, Washington, and helped me pay off my student loans. So (laughs) you have to have some of that in the back pocket, right? I think you are our first professional fisher person to be on the bartender. <laughs> yes. And, and it's one of those things that you asked me, what's a job I would, ne- or someone asked me, what's a job I would never want to do again. And I always mention that one. <laughs> that one. So yeah. how did you get from fish to HR? Well, you know, it's like everyone kind of, I don't know about many of you out there, but I, in my experience being in HR, most, most folks fell into it in some other way. I was a people person and I was working in a microbrewery in Oregon called McMinniman's Pubs and Breweries. Some of you who are out on the West Coast might know of McMinniman's, right? I know McMinniman's. Yeah, they're great. <laughs> they, they actually uh, still to this day, one of my most favorite jobs. And you know, wasn't sure if I was gonna go to law school, what I was doing, waiting at tables. And they said, hey, we're looking for someone to come in the office and help hire other bartenders, waiters, ser- you know, servers, the whole staff. And I thought, well, why not? You know, I, I can't, you know, I, I could see myself learning in a new trade. And so next thing you know, that was the beginning of my HR career. And everybody who has ever worked in the service industry probably knows some of your craziest HR stories probably come <laughs> out of the service industry and especially restaurants. So Let, let's um, see a bunch of early 20 somethings and an alcohol fueled culture. What could go wrong? Exactly. Working a lot of nights and weekends. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We have the employee relations issues. Oh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to work with Beth anymore because we broke up. Transfer me. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and Eric brought that one up, and I said that actually happened many a time. You know? um, and uh, yeah, so there's that fine balance with you know the the drug alcohol thing, and when you're promoting alcohol all day, you know. So, um, but it was a it was a great fun experience, and the best thing that they taught me is you take care of your people, and they will be incredibly loyal to you. So, um, Mike and Brian McMiniman, you know they they put in a, a, a amazing culture. I mean, this was the service industry 20 years ago where they had benefits and 401k and, you know, all sorts of great stuff. They still have people working for them 20 years, you know, waiting tables because they treat them so well. Mm. Um, so I think that got me on a roll of like, okay, I can, I, I like HR when you can really provide people these awesome experiences, but it rains a lot in Portland. So I moved to Texas. <laughs> I had to get some sunshine in my system and I ended up in Austin and uh, worked for a number of different companies from Whole Foods Market in their corporate offices when they were going through a lot of acquisitions, um, worked for CSC. That was my experience working for a ginormous consulting firm. I ran a benefits call center at the time it was called a call center because that's all people did was call you right? on the phone. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then I went on to work for a number of different software companies and dot com of the era that went from, you know, zero employees to 500 and IPO would and then was part of the dot com bust. And so we had I was there. Shut the doors and unfortunately lay everybody off, which was horrible because you're you're doing that and then you're laying yourself off, you know, <laughs> so yeah. I've been through a lot of those experiences as well. So um, but, you know, ended up, you know, I guess falling into this role of, you know, maybe bot when like you were bringing up at the beginning, I, I fell in love with chatbots. I saw them as a consumer and I thought, wow, this could be so impactful for the world of HR. And how do we leverage this new type of technology inside businesses to help employees, you know, to support them and, and, and create a journey and a path for them like we experience as consumers with some of the awesome brands out there. Right on. Well, you know, it, it's interesting, right? We were talking, we talk about AI a lot here on this show, and we, we've we been talking about its presence in HR and some of the pitfalls that come with it, right? The, the ethical dilemmas, the bias-based dilemmas. Um, when you're out there talking to potential customers, do you get any of that sort of pushback on, well, this, I don't know, I'm, I don't know if we're ready for that or... You know, yes. I mean, it's good for people to ask those questions and they should, you know, because this is technology that is powerful. But at the same time, I think when you, you know, uncover some of the myths that are out there, humans are training the machines still today. The machines are not just acting on their own. So what better people to train machines how to be ethically responsible than people that come from an HR background? That's my right. theory. <laughs> I mean, we, we know how to look at the world through a different lens and to make sure that we're considering a lot of different facts when you are going about the testing training of machine learning. However, when I put forward this technology, like, look, this is all about automation. This is helping to take some of the what I call low hanging fruit tasks off your plate so that we can help elevate the role of HR to have time to focus on more of the strategic work. That's what really resonates with people. Um, I don't know how many of you are out there, but no matter what level and role you get to in an HR organization, you are still going to get people sending you these types of questions <laughs> that take up valuable time from your day. And most of the questions are similar, no matter if you're at Whole Foods or at CSC, they're the same types of questions that employees ask from company to company. So isn't there a way that we can help, you know, pull together technology that services an employee in a manner where now we brought it up at the beginning of this, how do we support this remote onboarding process and hybrid mm -hmm. work? Well, give employees technologies and tools to do that, <laughs> to help them, you know, especially when we're in this global work force now and you've got people you know in india and in the uk and in south america you have to have this 24 7 mentality of support yeah you know it, it's interesting you know having grown up in hr and technology companies 
you know, they're largely small HR teams and you get, you get to deal with a lot of the frontline questions, you know, what's our vacation policy? How long do I have to be here before I start accruing days? When do I get my benefits, right? Just very basic blocking and tackling stuff that as HR practitioners, we complain about all the time. It's like, oh, why do I have to deal with so much of these bullshit questions every day, all day long? Um, but I can also see the flip side of that with HR people because I saw it when we made the shift from sort of the generalist stroke personnel model to the business partner model. Once, once things change, we start to feel like we could be obsolete and we start to be resistant to the technology. Do you ever see that from some of your HR folks inside your client companies where as the, as the, the chat bots become more, more ingrained into the organization and the, the machine learning starts to happen, they get better at their jobs that HR people start to push back. They get scared. To be honest with you, no. I mean, most of the people are embracing the technology to see it as a way that frees up some of their time to be more strategic. But the one thing we do, Eric, that's a little different is we have a dashboard on our product that shows usage. So we hmm. can actually give the HR professionals visibility to the 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 questions being asked by employees, meaning how many questions are being asked per day, what kinds of questions are being asked from what geographic location. And when you can provide people that information, that's that's really what it is. It's I think it's more curious and 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 right, frankly needing to know what is happening out there. What's the pulse of the organization? And if you can display it in a in a format that allows them to continue to work on on tasks that may help, again, in other areas of the business, for example, DNI initiatives and mm -hmm. compensation strategies and, you know, new ways to onboard employees during remote work. I mean, that's probably a better usage of their time. But then at the same time, seeing the dashboard, they get the comfort that the employees questions are being addressed. And if there is one area that has a lot of different types of questions surfacing, you know, our team actually brings those forward like, hey, there's a lot of people asking about, you know, logging into this, pay the payroll system. Is there, is there something <laughs> wrong? Is there as a system down? Is there something going on? Right. So that's kind of what I think people need to make sure that they're not losing track of. And so as long as the visibility is still there, I think it's um it's a control issue too. They're happy For to sure. let go of it a little bit, um, and and I don't think we were ever hired in HR to be customer service people. I think there were a lot of right. other functions that we were hired for that, frankly, um, deserve more attention and time. Absolutely, don't disagree with you at all. And and thanks for that story. Lori's asked a question. She wants to know if you can give us an example, Beth, of how the machine learning works in this context of HR chatbots. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good question. So um, first, I'll probably just back up and you know just for make sure everybody has some context of like what is a chatbot and and how does that part of natural language processing work. So a chatbot is designed to be a user interface that can live in tools like our solution is can installs in Slack as an app or in Microsoft Teams. And there's also a web application that can be inside SharePoint pages so that employees can ask in what we call natural language. So meaning they type a full sentence. It's not designed to be like a Google search. It's very similar to how if you've used Siri or Alexa, those mm -hmm. technologies work. And so they're based on. Does uh, yours have a name? Your chatbot, does it have a name? It's me, B bot. You know, that's the <laughs> name. <laughs> you know, we we had gone down a path of like coming up with something different, but the reason it's called me, B bot is like me, me, B bot lets me be efficient, lets me be productive. Oh, it's all I like about it. the it's all about the individual, you know, because again, we're we're really wanting to personalize this experience for the employee and make it 
their friend, right, to help them. Um, so when when they ask these questions in natural language, meaning how do I get a new insurance card, for example, mm -hmm. the the way the machine is learning is it's 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 designed to pick up what they call like weighted averages in the in the words. So mm -hmm. if you're a linguist person, if you like language, this is technology you would probably love because it uses a lot of those factors to determine that the the verb and the intent of the the com the the the, what they call an utterance, what it's all about. And then because we've curated a library of all the types of frequently asked questions common to businesses, there's essentially a, an AI, the AI mechanism is the fast matching of what this utterance mm. is to intents that are in our system. Now, the machine learning part comes in when an employee may get the wrong answer. It's not the machine is producing a different answer that's not quite right. And so then we per, up, apply the, what we call the human supervised learning to say, nope, nope, this is the, the right answer that you need to produce for that specific question. So there's times, again, the machine learning part comes in where employees ask questions about perhaps a new benefit that's not mm -hmm. certain in our knowledge base yet. We, we produce that that new topic to our back to the business user and say, Hey, did you just start offering something different and new for employees? You know, we, we probably need to add this into the solution. So we continue to kind of make it better and, and enrich the, the solution. Um, but that's how the machine learning process goes. Do you, do you capitalize? <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Do you capitalize on the commonalities uh, across all customers by building this sort of large aggregate database as well? Yeah, that's actually part of the the secret sauce of Mimi Bot is you know we have this this global we call it our customer portal of this this content. However, when employees are asking questions at the multiple employer sites, each each company has their own tenant or instance sure. of their portal. However, the machine training is mm. benefited by almost like a crowdsourced approach. So yeah. all these utterances are coming in, utilized, and then they're thrown out, but they train this AI data model on the back end. So the more we ingest from a multitude of different types of questions, customers and parts of the globe, and you know, the stronger the AI accuracy is on the answers that are produced. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, David, you had your hand up for a question. Yeah, and I just typed it in the chat also. It had to do with, uh, back to your question, so it's called MimiBot, right? But I assume it can be branded internally. And, and do companies do that where they, they make it, uh, name it something that is unique to the way they provide HR services? Or, or they just call it Ask Ruby? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Well, you know, it's great that you asked that, David, because when we first began, we really opened it up to that uh, concept of letting the employer brand it. And then between Microsoft and Slack, because those are our two kind of preferred channels of where MeBot installs, they were starting to change their methodologies of allowing mm -hmm. bots to be renamed. However, they've come back around and now um, for Microsoft Teams, we can now allow a company to utilize essentially MeBot in a white label form, if that makes sense. So they mm -hmm. are able to brand it because there's nothing more than we would want than for companies to embrace MeBot if it, they want to call it, like you, David, probably know the story of E2 Open. They were calling it Ava, E2 Opens Virtual Assistant. That's, yeah, that's what I was referring yeah, to. Yeah, and, um, and then they had, you know, able to do their whole campaigning around that mm -hmm. and produce marketing materials to kind of launch this whole branding initiative within their business. Now, they've since reverted back to MediaBot over time. It's, it's <laughs> mostly because of the teams um, and global use case that they now offer. Um, but, you know, at any point in time, if customers do want to rename the bot, we can't allow them to do that now because the technology is kind of caught up <laughs> with what uh, what the business users want. That's awesome. So you mentioned E2 Open. Uh, can you tell us about another uh, sort of customer success story, a big win for MeBot? 
Yeah, some of the folks in Austin might know of a company called Epicor Software. They were one of our customers that we we that have been we we call our customers innovation partners because we really do believe there's this power of you know building technology with your your partner, your customer. And so we happen to be you know, signing contracts with, with Epicor in January, 2020. And we all know what that kind of time frame was like, and then fast forward a couple months and we launched maybe bot in two months to their global workforce of over 4,400 employees in 30 countries, right when they were wow. moving all their employees home, you know, for remote work. And they did not have a culture before, you know, the pandemic of remote work at all. I mean, it was very much, you know, here is our office space and we really want to promote that. So it was quite a shift. And so they helped us come up with a lot of content we built into our solution around COVID, <laughs> you know, health health tip of the week, we started to offer up as an op option and questions around wellness and telemedicine and, you know, even, you know, safe return to work policies. So, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, need to really expand the knowledge base to support the types of questions employees have during all these changes. And so they, they were pretty instrumental in us understanding that um, and really, you know, giving us a visual of, of some of the challenges that, you know, they were encountering so that we understood how to better support them. Nice. So how easy is it to update the system? Is this a thing that gets done perpetually? Is it done on an interval basis? How does that work? It is designed for a business user in HR, IT, internal comms, facilities. Those are all the types of people that come into the MimiBot admin portal. It, for them to update it every day if they want and any okay. minute. Um, we want the business users to control and edit the content as frequently as it changes. Um, it's, the, it's the way to make sure that the consistent communications are being provided to employees. And we even initiated a new feature, I believe it was last fall before benefits open enrollment to allow companies to schedule answers to go live on a particular date and time. You know, those of you who worked out in, be in benefit world for so long know that January 1 is that date where all your benefits <laughs> are going to change and, and you better be ready for that person who needs to go pick up their prescription at the pharmacy on that, that January 1st date or second date and you changed insurance vendors and they don't know the new information, right? And so <laughs> this this feature and functionality al allows for that. So I, I love when you when you say that. I watch all the HR people's faces just start nodding and they yes. laugh. Yes. Oh, it was it's painful. They're like they're like <laughs> open enrollment. They get PTSD over open enrollment. And the, the <laughs> mantra is: Doesn't anyone read anything? That no, we no, they don't. <laughs> they read nothing. No. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it's like they forgot anything they knew about everything, and now they're like, everything's changed. And, you know, to be fair to employees, I don't know about you all, I was overwhelmed last year. I mean, I could only absorb so much information. And, you know, change was happening around us constantly. And so there gets to be this threshold. And um, I know that, you know, if people are asking more questions, it's because, you know, there's a lot of anxiety, there's, you know, uncertainty, there's you know, again, how much you can retain in a time of constant stress, right? Like the pandemic has brought a lot of individuals. For sure. For sure. Well, I want to, I want to make sure that I, I, I leave a minute or two to ask Evans Mayhew. He's the guy that shined the light on AI for us here in this group. Um, and he actually runs a, uh, a, an online learning portal about remaining relevant in the age of automation, Right. Which, so that's a, a germane topic to this one. So I wanted to make sure that Evans had the opportunity to ask anything that was burning in his brain as he's listening to you talk, Beth. Oh, thanks, Eric. Yeah. You know, and I, you got to bear with me. Um, so far, it's Wednesday and I feel like it's been three months this week. <laughs> it's been a brutal, brutal week. Um, first, Beth, pleasure to meet you. Um, have you read The Age of Intent by P.V. Cannon by any chance? 
No, I haven't, but you'll have to put that in the chat. Well, so you're, you're gonna you're gonna totally dig that. So um, if you go back to if you go back to Tom Friedman, when he was doing the whole globalization jam, he did Lexus and the Olive Tree, The World is Flat, on and on. Uh -huh. So when he did the world is flat, he started to go to call centers in India and start to explore those environments. And so you had large call centers in different sections. They had folks trained to speak in different American accents. So the South, Chicago, Boston, et cetera. And so Freeman went back recently and that company has radically changed and those call centers are virtually empty. And now they're running chat bots and what you described was precisely the methodology that they're using there with regards to machine learning. So they're having a handful of human customer service agents try to handle, uh, they have the, the chat bots handle it until it can't handle it any further. And so then what they're trying to do is they're trying to go back and try to determine the intent behind the conversation, where did things break down? and then try to get the chat bot developed accordingly so it can handle it better next time and then just go further down the path. So I guess one of the things that I've been seeing is that COVID-19 has been a massive accelerant in terms of the adoption of automation. So it's done more for digital transformation in one year than was, was planned for a five-year arc. So where do you see the adoption of, of chat bots going? Okay in the next five years? Well, you know, according to, you know, analysts like Deloitte and Gar Gartner and Accenture, you know, they're writing reports on this all the time. You know, they say one in one, in, one you may have 25% uh, of all organizations will have a digital assistant or virtual assistant in their ecosystem that they're working with within the next two years. So the, the, RPA or robotic process automation has been happening for a while and some of you may or may not know of it you may not even know it's happening but it's basically like bots triggering other bots to do tasks um, now the I think what's really advanced you know where we are with maybe bot and and natural language processing and chatbots in that sense has been consumer tools like Alexa and Siri right mm -hmm. so I see things you know the the behind this I call them the behind the scenes bots that are doing functional tasks I see that that's going to get more and more ingrained and it's already happening. The conversational AI chatbots, that's the direction we're taking where right now today, there's a lot of intent in what question does an employee have and we serve an answer. We also serve up some related topics, but we are really on a fast path to do more conversational AI flows. Mm. And this is when things get a lot more fun. If you ask me, <laughs> you know, okay, let's give the good HR scenario that I love, leave of absences, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, how many of you have done the leave of absence work? It's hard, right? And how can we help an employee walk through a leave of absence flow in a conversational way with an AI chatbot? And so that's the next foray that we're going down the path is to really build out this this more, you know, open enrollment. We were just talking about it. Why, you know, open enrollment, what's it all about? It's, do you want to change your benefits or not? Well, I don't know. Do you want to see what new benefits are offered? I mean, there are a lot of yes, no kind of statements. And if we can build those into mm -hmm. great conversational AI flows, we'll really help mm -hmm. employees, we'll help out the processes in, in business. And we'll see that in more areas than in HR. Like think about the, I call it the poor folks in accounting and finance. I mean, they have <laughs> their issues to deal with too. Procurement, who wants to do a purchase order? Nobody, right? And that's always a nightmare process. So how can you serve up? So we'll start to see them in these conversational flows um, where I think, I love to see more opportunity and it's coming, but I do believe this is the area where you have to put the asterisks that it must be used with caution is in predictive analytics and insights, which mm -hmm. is how can we take this data that we're capturing from these interactions, you know, you know, you know, if we are capturing interactions in a way that we can start to apply algorithms to have show some, some behavior patterns within people. So example is, I know IBM has played with this technology, Watson's their 
you know, yeah. smart brain. And um, how do you predict turnover before it happens, right? Mm -hmm. How do you predict flight risk in employees before they actually mm -hmm. leave a company? Mm -hmm. And so if you're IBM, you've got a ton of data about your people. A lot of the people have been there a long time and they likely have a lot of their, their fields and their HCM system actually filled out. So <laughs> they probably know what college they went to. They might have entered that in, what years of experience mm -hmm. they have. They might know their promotion history, the history of how what their percentage merit increase was year to year, um, if they had a lot of changes in bosses between a given time frame, and they're applying the algorithm to determine whether or not, you know, an employee might be a flight risk, you know, if perhaps they haven't gotten a raise for a while, they didn't have a promotion, and they've been absent from work quite a bit. So this is this is the direction that things are are moving, you know, in into perhaps as soon as five years, you know. Wow. Well, sure. And and my thing is, I'm not a luddite, so I've, I've been <laughs> in tech for a very long time, but I also understand human nature, and I understand how corporations work. And th this is a march that's not going to stop. Uh, it's it's just not for for myriad reasons, but I guess. I guess my question, and this this is a question I, I always like to ask when it comes to saying we're freeing up someone from mundane tasks in order to move to more strategic tasks or more creative tasks. My question is, doesn't isn't there isn't that predicated upon the existence of an organizational culture that wants to hear from you on those fronts at all? <laughs> so a lot of places. <laughs> A lot of places people don't, and but so now you've freed them up from doing what they were paid to do, and now they're invited to do creative and strategic. But leadership doesn't really give a rip, and so um, how how might that be handled? Yeah, that's 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 a toughie <laughs> because that has to come from inside the culture. You have to have a culture yeah. that promotes, you know, we hear a lot about it in all the HR publications, upskilling, you know, right. are you doing enough to upskill your people? So, yeah. you know, frankly, a lot of the customers that maybe bot works work with they are on the best places to work list. Mm -hmm. They've embraced a culture where the career development of their people is essential and important. Um, you know, they they know that technology can enable not only their own customers' experiences, but they want to flip that model onto their own employee experience. Sure. Um, those are more of the highly, mm -hmm. they're almost more highly evolved or hyper, but they're also the high performing companies, right? right. right. So there should not be a secret that if you treat your customers Customers well, and you have a great customer experience, and then you flip it back to your own employees too. Well, yeah. I know people don't leave companies like we started this conversation today with David's article. A lot of times they're not leaving over pay or even benefits. It's it's mostly because they don't have opportunities for growth and they don't have opportunities to learn more. Uh, I know when I used to do those exit surveys, you know, that's what it came down to. And I hope people do embrace more internal tools and solutions to help them, you know, really advance employees or they will be a revolving door. I mean, it is going to happen. I mean, turnover, you know, right now, I believe that it's 2.7 years is the average turnover. Well, wow. I'm a different, I'm a Gen Xer, but the millennials have no patience for <laughs> you. You don't, you don't help me get somewhere. I'm just going to go somewhere Peace. else, you know, <laughs> and it's even worse in the tech industry it's even hotter yeah, sure. turnover so you know i think that it has to be starting at the top like we all say it has to be that ceo you know level initiative that really drives this whole thing and i hope i hope you take that question in the spirit in which it was intended Just oh no absolutely i th you know i think a lot about it because it isn't i mean this technology is not right for everybody yet yeah. you know and the people that understand that again um, we people weren't hired to just be a, a call center in HR. You're hired to put together strategic plans for the business and to, mm -hmm. you know, maybe handle escalated issues and employee relations, you know, sensitive things that are happening in the organization that you never can tell anybody about that took up half your day, right? <laughs> um, so that's what the time would be better spent doing, right? Awesome. Awesome. Laurie, you had a question. I don't wanna, I'm sorry. I didn't want to hug the mic. 
Oh. <laughs> One Sorry, Lori, Lori, go go ahead, Evans. Real quick, but. No, never mind. It, it's, <laughs> it's a big one. It's about empathy and shepherding <laughs> and the ML process and asking how do you start to steer towards empathy. So if you have time towards Ooh. the end, we can talk about that. Okay. All right. Well, and it, that's kind of in line with where I was going and actually your last comment, Beth, about some of those um, sort of higher order functions of HR because, right, it's, it's ingrained in us about confidentiality and about you know, specific, unique circumstances. And there is not one size fits all for a lot of situations. And and it made me think of that with the the leave of absence conversation. And, you know, (laughs) people may or may not feel comfortable just typing in the diagnosis of the thing (laughs) that they've got that is necessitating the leave, or they'll refuse to disclose because they are hypersensitive to those confidential issues. And so, you know, that's one example. Others are harassment, you know, seeing, seeing Chuck, you know, asking the, you know, predictive types of things where, what, what's the, what's the trigger to stop the bot and introduce the the human? (laughs) Because, right, if we're tracking data and there's machine learning, you don't want people's personal medical histories as part of some record that can, Mm. right, that can be disclosed. So I'm just thinking through the the conversation. Or subpoenaed. It's subpoenaed, exactly, right? And then you terminated that person. Well, you know, I was just interacting with the system telling them that I was X, Y, Z, and then lo and behold, I'm let go in the riff or for whatever. So, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of thinking down that devil's advocate path. How do, how do you incorporate that into this design? Yep. Uh, great question. So first of all, I think there is an employment attorney on the call somewhere <laughs> out there, right? Um, is that you, Chuck? Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. And- technology. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the first things I always think of is, you know, the use of computer policy, right? When you sign, when you come to work for an employer, you are saying anything you do on this laptop is computer property. And that's one of the things that we, the first time you interact with MeBeBot, it actually will say, you know, things like this is, you know, this is a tool being provided to help you. Please don't share any confidential information. You know, like this is just here for questions and answers. So that's how we kind of put this kind of disclosure out there. But at the end of the day, the employers that are working with us, that are customers, I mean, they know that, you know, we're, we're kind of like under the guise of the whole use of computer type of policy. Um, I mean, how many of you had to fire people for things that they were using their computers for that weren't appropriate, right? <laughs> I mean, and uh, it happens. And <laughs> no, so, no, it's not, in, it's not in Chuck's book either. There's nothing about that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, gosh, I think we all have the stories. Right. <laughs> and um, and, you know, let's be real. I mean, IT monitoring software on computers has been there for a long time. I mean, that's how I learned that a whole new group of employees that were from France didn't know they couldn't look at porn at work, you know, <laughs> when I was at one of <laughs> well, my is it even Is it even yeah. porn in France? I don't <laughs> yeah. think so. They were like, what? You can't look at this at the workplace? I'm like, no. <laughs> you know? So that was that was 20 years ago. Maybe things have changed. I don't know. But, um, but I didn't know. I mean, how would I know that in HR? But somebody in IT had to tell us because they were hitting IP sites, right? IP addresses yeah. mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so but today we take an approach of a crawl crawl walk run okay so today maybe bot has more of an anonymous view of an employee so when an employee asks a question they come to us as a code so we don't know who they are where mm-hmm. they 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 Ooh. self-select where nice. they live but right now they are anonymous to us and i say right now because we do have a path to getting to integrating to back-end systems and allowing the person if they want to opt into a private conversation with maybe bot to serve up for example a paycheck stub mm-hmm. from an adp system they would be able to do that but Today, the technology is designed, ask a question, get an answer, non-identifiable code, um, and it is question-answer basis. And, and again, we put out some disclosures at the beginning so that they know, you know, you are using a company property solution. Mm-hmm. Um, we also made a very conscious choice uh, to your point about escalating issues. You know, if I'm an employee and I ask, like, what's our maternity leave policy? 
but I don't want anybody to know that I'm pregnant, you know, yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe I didn't get the details that I really wanted to get from that interaction with Mimi Bot. I don't want it to automatically generate a ticket to HR. No, right. you know, because I'm Call not ready right. about being knocked up. Yeah, right? so, exactly. especially, especially if it happened the week after sales conference. That's a bad thing. Oh, my God. I guess we've all heard those stories, too. Right? Yeah, we've been there. Yeah. Those sales reward trips, I don't know. Right? President's um, Club. Woo! President's now everybody's Club. pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. So, so we've, we've made some choices along the way to make sure that there's definitely points in time that people can act, act to escalate and, mm-hmm. you know, get an answer to a question. Um, but you know, it ta- you know, it, we spend time thinking about this and we work with our customers to ensure that, you know, we meet their guidelines. Now question like harassment, you know, we have a harassment question and answer in our, in our database. It just simply says like any type, we reiterate like the policy for harassment, like any type of harassment is not tolerated. Please contact HR immediately. You know, if you want a list of your HR business partners, here it is, you know, and that's how we handle that type of topic. So <laughs> So, so the system's not going to pop out a note to Lori to say, Hey, be on the lookout for Chuck. He's asking all sorts of dodgy questions about (laughs) sexual harassment. As in hypothetically, if somebody were to have done this, what might happen to them? (laughs) Or if you get a lot of questions about a single person or a single department or a single uh, facility is, does that trigger some responsibility on the part of the organization to lean in further? Um, And so I'm curious about this predictive technology. It's fascinating. Yeah, it, it is. And, and and to that point, you know, that's where it's kind of going. Once you start to identify the individual and then you can know where they live, you know, meaning they, you know, mm-hmm. active directory, when an IT department sets up a new hire, they put in the employee, where they live, what business unit they're in, who, who their manager is, all that good stuff. Well, you know, if you are able to see that there's a pattern of several people asking about harassment that happened to all work for one particular manager. What do you do? Right. Right. So these, these are our hot topics and that's why we are on a crawl, walk, run approach, you know, (laughs) because we work with our business partners, you know, our customers to really determine what is the best approach to take on these. And, you know, we talk to attorneys as well, you know, to understand we're in the letter of the law we are. And again, today we're a knowledge base, a content, you know, and we're answering specific questions. Yeah. Right. It's fascinating. Oh, I love it. This has been awesome. Beth, I want to be mindful of everybody's time because we're coming up on the hour here. Um, Guys, any other questions for Beth before we transition back into our end of show routine? Around one once. Mm-hmm. Going twice. All right. Big ups for Beth for being here today. <laughs> it's been awesome. I think we could have another hour long conversation, especially down the, the tangent that that was headed. Um, you know, what what is the me be bot of five years from now? Right. I think mm-hmm. when you get to that, when you get to that run stage of your, your crawl, crawl, walk, run approach, um, you know, how different will that be from this? management of a knowledge base, right? How different will that be when the system is now making decisions, even if they're very elementary decisions, but making decisions nonetheless? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just, just to put th- thoughts into your minds, there is easy ways to get started on a path to leveraging AI in your organizations. It doesn't have to be all scary and creepy. Um, it's <laughs> not going to, robots are not going to take over your jobs. Um, Deloitte, um, Chris Havrilla, one of the analysts from Deloitte, I love her. She's amazing. She write, she coined a term called as in her team called the super team. And it's about how do you combine the machine and the people to really be, you know, a, a new superpower. And I just want everybody to kind of think about that because I don't think one happens without the other. The design of this and other solutions like in AI are not to replace people's jobs, but to, again, you know, streamline operations so we can be more efficient, be more productive, be more supportive of our, our, our people, right. For the different world of work that we live in. 
I would love to chat with you about that, to talk about (laughs) Centaur systems that Kasparov originally put forth. And Kevin Roos just wrote a new book called Future Proof, talking about the failure of Centaur systems. Beth, I would love to to chat with you about about all that. (laughs) Yeah. There's some other ones that I could add to your your reading list too. Um, one of the analysts from Willis Willis Wyatt Watson, I'm draw, it's called it's the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and it's a very mm. fascinating book as well. And I'm drawing a blank on his name. Klaus Schwab. No, it's not him. Um, uh, oh goodness. I'll come up with it, of course, after this call. And I'll share That's it. That's all right. <laughs> you, yeah, you let us know. We'll make sure everybody gets a hold of it. Um yeah, that was awesome, Beth. How do we how do we find you if anybody here on the network on the call today or listening to it in the future decides I need to get a hold of Beth at Mebe Bot? Where do we find you? Yeah, I'll get, I'll put my email address in the chat and uh, and then of course you we've got Dawn and Victor and Kevin out here from our team and and we can all be reached from our you know company website. We have a pretty active presence on LinkedIn. We like to show a lot, share a lot of interesting articles. Victor helps us write a lot of amazing content and blogs. And, and uh, so you can find us on LinkedIn at mebibot.com as well. Um, so, you know, please, you know, even if you're just curious and you want to just see a, a demo, we'll be happy to walk you through the solution. I love it. Well, Beth, thank you so much for being here today. Guys, let's give her another round of applause because she deserves it. Thank you. All right, let's do our funny things, our good things, our silly cocktail, and let's go to dinner, shall we? Today's big funny things. Funny thing number one. Here we go. COVID. Dracula's castle in Romania offers tourists vaccine. Yeah, I'm not falling for this one. (laughs) Oh. So wait, you guys, I have to chirp in here. The company I used to work with, OSF, uh, we used to do, um, we used to do like a a Days of Excellence. And so I've actually been to Dracula's Castle in Romania, probably about a half a dozen times. (laughs) (laughs) You you, you left with all the blood you went in with, did you, (laughs) Don? Let me tell you what, it is, it is this huge castle and it, and they have done a really good job on showing a lot of the old um contraptions for torture and you know their weapons uh, but, good family and, fun family and fun really <laughs> amazing and i am not surprised that they're offering them <laughs> it out there <laughs> and it's vlad vlad the impaler, the impaler. yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I have yeah. A of me and him together it's really <laughs> funny there's i mean there's no place i'd rather get my vaccine than the home of vlad the impaler <laughs> <laughs> and, on, and on that note, from the CDC's guidance this week, finally, we can get back to the way things were. <laughs> uh, uh, this one, this just made me laugh. Tears, literal tears, it says. This is a text exchange between somebody in Colorado. Hey, Cameron, it's Cole. We spoke at the bar last night and you gave me your number. Hey, sorry, dude, this isn't Cameron. She was either drunk or she gave you the wrong number. Damn, that hurts. Four months later. Hey, it's Cameron from the group project. Did you add a bibliography? (laughs) Oh! (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, Cole. (laughs) Um, And I'm just just gonna leave this one right here for you to look at. Can you all believe I got a picture with a pigeon? Oh. <laughs> oh, and my favorite, favorite, my favorite funny thing. I'm not even going to say it. I'm just going to put it up here. This is for Laurel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, my rights are great. <laughs> This is why, speechless. Yeah, this is why some people need to continue to work remote. <laughs> <laughs> Hit the nail on the head there, David. Oh. All right, today today's good feel story. This is uh, from the Iowa Cubs, a minor league baseball club, um, and their their owner 
a Mr. Gartner. He is 82 years old. Uh, the, the, the company has essentially been on hiatus for 604 days. Mm. And they kept every employee on the payroll, full pay, full wow. benefits. It cost him four million dollars, and 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 the eighty-two-year-old Mr. Gartner said, "I just tried to keep things in perspectives. They needed the money more than I did." Wow, that's wow. incredible. I thought that was pretty awesome. Lori says he's a great guy. Lori, do you know him? <laughs> <laughs> of course she does. <laughs> Awesome. So today's semi-quarantine cocktail, uh, it's work is literally killing people. This is a riff on the Pisco Sour, and it's on uh, some WHO information that came out this week. Long working hours are killing hundreds of thousands of people a year, says the WHO. You're going to need a little bit of Pisco. The International Labor Organization estimated that in 2016, some 745,000 people died as a result of having worked at least 55 hours a week. Dang. Little, little bit of lime juice. Uh, people that did that uh, had a estimated 35% higher risk of a stroke. Little lemon juice. Uh, guys, this was a pre-pandemic research project. Little simple syrup. So yeah, it's worse now. An egg white. Yeah, so unplug, hang out, watch some TCB and chill. <laughs> Top it with a little Angostura bitters and then go watch that Phil McKinney episode because it's a great one. Guys, thank you <laughs> so much for being here today. Wednesdays are my favorite days and you guys are my favorite people. I love each and every one of you. We'll see you next week. Thanks again to Beth for being here. You're Thanks, awesome. Sarah, you guys are all Thanks, awesome. Guys. Thank, thank you. you. A lot of fun. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a good time and learned a thing or two at today's happy hour, please share it with your friends. If you want to join our tribe, head on over to skyteam.cloud forward slash TCB or email us at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again. And remember, you've always got friends at the corporate bartender.